So welcome to the Tuesday, June, January 16th um, meeting for the artist talk. This is part of the Jewish Heritage Month at Foothill Dance College, Foothill College. Um, and there's many events on our website and this uh, for this very special month. Anything you want to say about that, Victoria, inviting people or anything? Um, I would just say that, um, you know, the Jewish Heritage Month is a part of our series of um, health and heritage months that we have all year long, starting in October with Latinx, November, Native American Heritage Month, and then starting off the new year in January with Jewish Heritage Month. So um, just periodically invite people to circle back to that this heritage site uh, for you know foothill.edu forward slash heritage and all the new months are updated here with the events um, most of the events are on campus now as we're pretty much kind of fully back but we usually have at least one mm -hmm. or two virtual events so thank you for joining us for this and if anyone ever has any questions pertaining to the Heritage Months, I'm the person to contact, as you can see on this page here. Um, I am the advisor for all of the Heritage Months, um, so I work with all of the planning committees and can take any ideas that anyone might have or feedback or questions. Um, happy to do so. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victoria. So right now, we do have an exhibition up in the Krauss Center for Innovation of Mark Tushman's work. And Mark is, uh, has worked as an international freelance photographer for more than 34 years. He's committed to the issues of global health and development, and he received the Photographer of the Year Award from the Global Health Co Council in 20, 2009 and 2010. Faces of Courage, Intimate Portraits of Women on the Edge, was published in 2015 and documented the lack of autonomy that women and girls face in the developing world and all the efforts designed to empower them. Faces of Courage was recognized as one of the best photography books of the year by American photographer. In 2018, Mark started another extended project documenting the contributions of immigrants to America. Together We Rise, Immigrants in America is going to be published this year. And that exhibition that we have is excerpts from that book. Over the years, Mark has become more motivated to use his photography to communicate in a more socially conscious way, a way that exposes people to both the degrees of human suffering that exist in today's world and to the courage and fortitude that people manifest to overcome it. I am just thrilled to introduce my dear friend and my colleague, Mark Tushman. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And... Um... Let me see if I can share my screen and see if we get started here. Okay. Okay, so um, I guess. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Kate. And um, th this is uh, a copy of the first book I did, and it was published in 2015. And I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, I I made a transition into photography rather late in life. I guess it was 40, over 44 years ago. And uh, my original intention, I was really working as a computer scientist at Stanford. Uh, and uh, I decided I really wanted to become a photographer. And what the people that really influenced me was a lot of the photographers who were doing social documentary work. So my original intention was to be a foreign art social documentary photographer and do books and have exhibits. And after two years of uh, trying that, and um, you know, I had some uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco buy some of my prints, and I had to exhibit a, a, a prestigious gallery in San Francisco, but I wasn't able to earn a living. So when my son was born 44 years ago, I, I realized that he really had to earn a livelihood, and 
I became a commercial photographer doing advertising and corporate work. And I concentrated, you know, almost always on people because I always felt that was my strength. And, um, but, you know, so, the, but the need to uh, do social documentary work and um, never really left me. So as Kate said, like 10, in 20, 2005, I started this 10 year project and uh, it, I interspersed all these assignments with my commercial work, so it took a long time to do. And um, but it was, you know, very well received and had exhibits in, in a lot of different countries with this work. But um, after this um, project, I, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but my intentions, you know which had been directed to a lot of uh, international issues um, with the current political situation in our country, I decided I'd better concentrate on my own country. And one of the things that really uh, incensed me, that motivated me, was the uh, anti-immigrant and racist rhetoric that uh, became blatant during our last administration. And um, it was very deeply offensive to me to hear how immigrants were being vilified in the halls of Congress, in, in the media, in the streets of our country. And I grew up in an immigrant community on the Lower East Side of New York. And um, it was a, <clears throat> a very heavily Jewish community. And um, I actually lived in a, a tenement flat with my parents and grandparents for the first five, six years of my life. And I, I had a view down from the window, of the, a, the front window, a tenement flat is like a railroad flat, you know, it has two windows basically in the front. And as I looked out the window, I, it was looking down a commercial street and it, it became so obvious to me how hard immigrants work to improve the lives uh, not only of their families, but um, but especially their children, and the way they were being vilified was seemed so uh, unjust and didn't have anything to do with reality. So so many of the people came here to risk their lives to just come here, and it became also very obvious to me that I wouldn't even be here talking to you if my grandparents hadn't emigrated to the United States or hadn't been allowed to emigrate to the United States back to the turn of the last century. Because as you know, most of the Jews who remained in Europe perished in the Holocaust. So my existence was really due to the fact that my grandparents were allowed to come live here in the United States. So, so I was very motivated to do a book on immigrants. And um, this is the cover of the book. And um, as we uh, as we speak right now, the book is actually being printed and I expect it to uh, have it in hand, uh, hopefully the end of March, beginning of April. Um, now, when, when I started doing the, the book, I, I just started, photographing asylum seekers because um, that seemed that they, they were really having a very hard time and being denied. But I expanded the, the project and I had three main criteria for the book. I wanted to include people in as many countries as possible. And I wanted to include immigrants with all sorts of uh, different levels levels of uh, documentation from those that were undocumented, uh, those that had uh, were seeking asylum, those with DACA recipients, those that had all sorts of different levels of, of visas, and finally, those with full citizenship. And I very importantly, I wanted to include people from all walks of life, from 
people doing essential manual labor to those that were highly skilled in high tech medicine and the law. Um, so um, now the, the whole point of the book was is really trying to break down barriers and, and increase uh, compassion and em empathy towards immigrants. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and that's a heavy lift, you know. I, I had to decide how was I going to do that? And I thought the best way to show was really to show how immigrants contribute to our country. And um, what was it? I start, there's five set, five or six sections in the book. And in each section is has a, a different theme to it and how immigrants contribute. Now, the first section is um, a section on uh, our lands, our food. And uh, it features people that are all in the food chain from farmers and farm workers, restaurateurs, and, people in the food distribution, everything. And uh, I've always been one to go to uh, farmer's markets and, you know, really appreciate all the fresh produce that I'm so privileged to enjoy. And yeah, I really wanted to show the hard work that was really involved in creating all this bounty of food that we take for granted. So I I'm just going to start with with just some images from the book, and then I'll get into some of the spreads. And this is just images from the first section of the book, Our Food, Our Land. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more stories, but since this is a photo group, I thought I'd still go with just some photos. Okay, so this is a typical spread. And um, I'm gonna try and tell you a little bit of a story about each person. Uh, this is Javier and he's a fantastically successful uh, organic strawberry farmer. And uh, he's kind of a outlier in a way um, he, in the fact that he's been so successful. He, uh, he was trained by this program in uh, not in Watson and Selena is called Alba, where they, they train farm workers who, who people that really want to transition to becoming their own farmers. And um I'm, well, I could tell you a lot about him, but um you in each uh, photo I have a quite a lengthy narrative and it's in the first person about these immigrants telling their own story and how they came to this country and how they contribute, basically. And one of the things that Javier mentioned to me that always stuck in my mind, that it actually takes a lot of skill to grow the delicious organic strawberries that he was able to produce, and that it was basically bullshit that we only need highly skilled workers. And that really, really, um, I feel that to be very, very true. A second, I want to see if I can move something here. Okay. And this is Roberto, and uh, he's always have a little quote from each person along with the story. And uh, one of the unfortunate circumstances is so many of these farm workers may could may be undocumented. I, I never asked whether they were documented or not. And, uh, but the fact that we don't have documentation or visas for people like that is, is really criminal because they really 
don't have any rights. They have they still have to pay taxes, but they can't get health care or social security or anything. And more importantly, they they really can't go and visit their families in Mexico. They're, they're really just, you know, it's stuck here in the U.S. and it's a tragedy that they can't visit their families. Huh. Why are we switching? Well, this is Teresa, and you see she's uh, another farm worker. And she hit her face, and um, you notice that she there's a big band aid over her nose, and it's hiding a big gaping hole. And she came here, you know, fleeing for her life. She had a very, very abusive husband who basically took a big bite out of her nose. It's really just chilling to even have to say that. And, and this is Berta, another strawberry farmer. And you know, I, get, I kept getting a lot of the same messages that these people just want to be respected. They want to be seen as equals. And one of the things about a lot of these farmers is that you know their children grow up and they don't want to go into farming. They they get they get educated and they, they do other work. So we, we're always going to have this need for people to do you know farming work and have uh, farm workers. This is Jose. He was actually the last person I photographed for the book. And it was at an apple farm in Northern California. And he's, he's up on a you know, 12 foot, 14 foot ladder. And the bag he's holding around his waist, he fills it to there's 70 pounds of apples in it. He does it many, many times a day. And as he says, without farm workers like me, there's no apple pie and no apple juice. And um, this is Juan, and um, he's just, he's a blackberry and raspberry farmer, and he just really believes in working hard, and that's what they came here to do, and these people work really, really hard. This is Habibi, she's from Turkey, and she runs a food bank here in Silicon Valley, and um, and it's grown to be, you know, rather large food bank. Just whoops. I, I give me a second. I realize I have to plug in my my uh, laptop here. Sorry. Yes, just, to plug it in. I encourage everyone in the webinar if you'd like to post your question under Q and A, and then we'll get to the questions at the end. Okay. Um. This is Ephraim, and this is a wonderful story. He doesn't speak a word of English. He's a tomato farmer. And um, he's very, very focused on educating his uh, three children, his uh, twin daughters and his son. And when I photographed him, he was making sure that his children got a good education. He was always taking him to um, academic challenges over the weekend. And his two twin daughters, when I photographed him, they were in UCLA, one studying to be a doctor, one a lawyer. And his son was in San Luis Obispo, studying to be an engineer. So I really thought that it was a really excellent example of how immigrants come here to work hard to really improve the lives of their children. And this is Rolando, and he's a person who kind of achieved the American dream. He came here and he founded a winery and uh, done very well for himself. This is Ernestina, and she's a farm worker. And this was a sad story because <clears throat> she, she, she worked in the field when she was pregnant and they, they spray these pesticides. And the unfortunate well, the consequence of that is that the children uh, when, are very, very affected uh, when, during the gestation period. 
and they, they, they have a lot of uh, psychological problems when they are, are grown up or growing up. So both her boys have very serious psychological issues. And, you know, she, if she reports it, the people come out and, uh, you know, they, they clean, the farmers clean up their acts and nothing happened. And then she could get fired. So it's, it's, it's really awful. You know, a lot of these farm workers are just treated as disposable human beings. This is Pedro. He's a, he's a, a, a manager of a wonderful pizzeria here. And he said, all oh, immigrants want to, want to see change. We want the Congress to see how important we are to this country. This is Chef Chu, and uh, I should have put his spread in here, but he's one of the more successful immigrants I photographed in this book. He has one of the longest thriving, continually operated Chinese restaurants in the United States here in Mountain View. And uh, he's very, very successful. He's become a philanthropist himself. This is Jose, and uh, he's a uh, second generation farmer from the Central Valley. And one of the things he told me, like, you know, his parents are not citizens, even though they've had a successful farm, they have no uh, rights, they, they, they're they ill, they're getting older, and they can't afford to see doctors because they have no health insurance. And so it's another one of the injustices. Uh, there is a series of chefs. Uh, this is Zareen, and I don't know if you know Zareen's here in the peninsula, but it's really, really delicious uh, Indian Pakistani food. And uh, if you go there, you'll see people from like all over the world. And uh, she says, I think immigrants add a lot of color to our culture. We experience different cuisine, different ways of living, different mindsets different ideas from different parts of the world. It all adds to the fabric of America. This is Hanif, and he's from Iran, from northern Iran, and he also has a, a restaurant, I think, in Berkeley. And he's trying to connect our cultures through food. And it's a heavy lift right now. This is Mina, and uh, he had a bakery where he was doing um, gluten-free uh, baked goods, and even had a gluten-free baklava, which um, I ordered and tasted, which was surprisingly delicious. This is Nigel, he's from Jamaica. And it, it, I, I think these interviews are really, really important to read. Um, <laughs> when we were designing the book, um, the designer wanted to make the pictures bigger, and I said, no, the interviews are even more important than the photos. And um, so um, I think they're very, very important to read their stories and, and their, their belief and their faith in, in our country. So the other section, I thought the second most important section was our health, because you know, immigrants are, really greatly contribute and are an integral part of our healthcare system. I think um, without immigrants, mo most of our major medical institutions would just shut down. And six years ago, my wife had major uh, surgery at the Stanford Medical System. And I think all but one of her doctors um, wasn't an immigrant. And um, it, it, it's just remarkable how, how many, how we really depend on immigrants for our healthcare. So this is Andrea Rivas Dreyfus, and she's an emergency room physician at the, uh, and I photographed her, it was at Highland um, uh, Hospital in Oakland. And she lamented that so many immigrants come in these very, very advanced cases of their disease because they're just so fearful of going to the doctor. He's afraid of, of 
you know, getting deported. And, you know, that's not true. A doctor wouldn't do that. This is for Rester. Oh, she's from Iran. And she's uh, really quite an amazing researcher at the uh, Stanford Genome Center. And she's working on uh, uh, autoimmune diseases, specifically chronic fatigue syndrome, which inflicts uh, many, many uh, people in this country. And it's very similar to long COVID. And it's very, very complex. And uh, she's trying to do basic research to really get to the bottom of it. Is you know, current medicine really doesn't have any answers for it, but very important, very vital work. Uh, this is Jose Higarada. He's a psychologist in the Central Valley, and he talks about how hard immigrants work, and um, and basically how this country was really built by immigrants. Uh, this is Mar Maria Mendoza Sanchez, who has quite a remarkable story. Um, she was an oncology nurse also at Highland Hospital. And for seven or eight years, she was fighting deportation. And she finally lost that battle. And she had to actually leave the country for a year and a half. And uh, she had to leave her family behind. She, she had three daughters here who were basically, you know, Americans and uh, they needed to be educated here. And she was beyond psychologically distraught. And she actually, by chance, uh, got a lottery tickets to, to come back to this country, which is very, very hard to do. So she came back and got a job back at the Highland Hospital, but I think the, the fact that she was an oncology nurse and was deported is really just outrageous. And this is Nargis, and she's a, a, a licensed vocational nurse. And one of the things that uh, a lot of immigrant workers do is really take care of our elderly. And uh, the elderly people are very, very dependent on immigrant nurses. This is Rava, and she's uh, trained to be a phys physician assistant at Stanford. And she said even at Stanford, she uh, felt a lot of discrimination, which was really surprising to hear, and, but uh, maybe not so much now in light of recent events. And this is Razan. She's a physician from uh, Syria. It was another really amazing interview. And a very, very open, loving person. And she actually did her internship, I think, in Nebraska. And even with a hijab, you know, she was very well accepted because she's so open. And she worked for uh, two or three years in a community in the Central Valley where they have very little physicians. So she was able to get her citizenship that way. This is Adi. He's from Nigeria. And he uh, started a, a high tech company where uh, people can monitor uh, people that have heart problems that have to be on a certain regimen to to get better. He, he developed an app to really help track their health care. And he had to fight deportation, even though he was the CEO of this new company that he created. And as he says, you know, we come here to, to build this country because we're really building basic infrastructure. And this is Hector Benia, and he's uh, another doctor at Stanford, and he's the only doctor really who treats uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and long COVID. It's very, very important work. And I can hardly pronounce his name, Suriyat, but everybody calls him new. And he's um, one of the very, very few undocumented immigrants in this country who have become physicians. A remarkable story. This is Delmi, who's another home care provider. And Rania, who's a psychotherapist at Stanford, who uh, really, during a 
height of Islamophobia in was it 2018, 2019. She, she had to do a lot of counseling with a lot of um, Muslim students at Stanford. So the next section is our economy. And uh, our economy is very, very in, 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 uh, dependent on the contribution of immigrants. Just want to read some facts that um, over seven trillion in revenue is generated by Fortune 500 companies founded by immigrants or children of immigrants. A total of 219 companies in the Fortune 500 company list had immigrant roots. 102 of those companies were founded by immigrants, and 117 were founded by the children of immigrants. So. Americans greatly contribute to our country. This is Mayank Bawa, and um, he founded several companies. And he told me how his first company he founded, he worked with people from like six or seven different countries all working together. But he was telling me how hard it was to get people to um, work now because of the uh, limited number of H1B visas. and whether or not they'll get renewed is always up in the air and it takes a year for them to for them to train a person to bring up to speed and it doesn't know if those people can stay or not. So it's a real problem. This is Amado and he's a, a civil engineer. He's helping to build some of the Facebook buildings. And uh, he was an immigrant and he also benefited from a, a local group here called Upward Scholars who helped to uh, educate him. So, you know, one of the things uh, I included in, in the economy was also people who had all sorts of jobs, not just entrepreneurs, but people who were doing like really essential labor that we always take for granted. And Doroteo is a, is a, a janitor at the Stanford University. And he said, he says like, you know, immigrants do not take work away from Americans. And uh, even though he's been there for 25 years, he still, uh, he still gets a janitor salary, basically. Uh, this is Charles Asano with his wife, Vanessa. They're both immigrants. He's from Cameroon. And one of the, things he told me was like he also got here on the lottery. And there was a lot of myths going around about the California lottery. I'm not, I'm not the California lottery, the US lottery. That anybody who got a lottery ticket could just, uh, the uh, immigration lottery could just come here and say that wasn't true. You had to show that you had an education, that you had people in this country who could come and support you. So there was a lot of myths going around about it. Anybody who won an immigration lottery could just come here. It wasn't true. This is Teresa, who's a domestic worker, and only raised since she got her citizenship because she was a victim of the sexual violence. This is Nargis from Nasadi, who's become a, also a good friend of mine, and she's an entrepreneur. And um, she's uh, was a successful, uh, very successful, of uh, founded a company that did genetic analysis, high speed genetic analysis, and she's able to uh, uh, Rosha actually bought the company. Now she's working on projects to use uh, science and high tech to uh, basically and deal with a lot of social issues that the, the world is facing currently. And this is Sandeep, and he's a, a, a senior engineer at Google. And, uh, he, he told me that he was actually one of the engineers who just recently uh, was in charge of building a new AI computer. And uh, he came from very, very humble beginnings. And uh, he got a scholarship to go to undergraduate school in Iowa. And he really believes in the American dream to said if, if it could work for someone like him and came from humble beginnings, he'd like to see that dream continue. 
This is Lily Sarafan, another immigrant from Iran, who started a very successful, uh, I think, home care company. And I think she has like 15, 20,000 employees. And this is Natalia, and uh, she's a software engineer. And she was from Ukraine. And, and uh, I think the quote that she gave me was uh, really important. But one thing I really like about the United States is people have power to influence the decisions of the politicians. That's something that doesn't exist in many countries. Oops. Um, Give you five minutes, Mark, so that and then we can, so we can take the questions. So I just want to give okay, you. I better hurry. I'll, I'll hurry up. Let me go through. This is some of our educators. Um, this is Ileana, and she, she runs this program, Immigrants Rising. And um, one of the little known facts is that if you're even if you're undocumented and you can start a company, you you can get some sort of status and be able to stay in our country. And um, let me get to some. I'll just try and wrap real quick. This is Marta, and uh, she she does. Uh, she's a preschool teacher, and she lives in a trailer park here in the city, and uh, is really, you know, motivating her children to get a good education as well. Okay. Faria worked as a. Uh, uh, a I, I, how much how much time do I have to finish? There's a few more minutes and then we should take questions. So keep on going. Okay. This is uh, our, our justice system. And here I have a lot of people who are um, asylum uh, seekers or received asylum. This is Maria with her two daughters. This is Naha, so she's from Iran. And she's a superior court judge. Uh, Olga came here from Honduras and uh, fleeing sexual violence, sexual abuse, seeking asylum. Esmeralda, another woman seeking asylum with her other two daughters. And I think the last section of the book is our future. And here I have a lot of DACA recipients. Eliana is at, I was at Harvard getting a master's degree. Um, Sarahi um, st started an app applicant to application, an app to um, for dreamers to see how they can get scholarships because there are private scholarships being given and she was awarded um, this uh, honor by the uh, Obama administration. And Luis Romero is uh, another student who, at, uh, who is very, very highly motivated. He's going to try and get a PhD, I believe, in English, even though he came here as not even speaking the word of English. And he's a very intelligent student. He's also been helped by this local group, Upward Scholars. And uh, this is Jesus, who uh, wants to become a doctor was working as a COVID researcher at UCSF. So if if people are interested in, in the book, they can, this is my email, and uh, they can just email me and I'll put them on a, a, a mailing list and let them know when the book is available. It should be available, I said, like end of March, uh, beginning of April. Okay, so I I can take questions now. If you like. Okay, you want to stop share? Um, I'm going to stop your sharing so we can see your face, Mark. Okay. And then Judy, Judy do you want to um, you, you be the voice of the the questions? The voice of the questions. <clears throat> yeah, I want, Mark, to, I want oh. to also welcome Ron Herman, our dean of fine arts and communications, mm. to the conversation. Hello. Um, yeah, your photos are amazing. I could keep going for another hour. So thank you so much, Mark. I really want to encourage everyone to come down and check the show out at the KCI Building 4000 here at Foothill Campus. 
Um, and we'll be having a, a reception for Mark and his work and hopefully some of the people he worked with um, coming up soon. So stay tuned. Um, all right. So we've got some really excellent questions. Um, and the first one will be from Christina Starr, who is at, and I love this question, right? Was it hard to find people that wanted to be photographed for your project? Uh, yeah, it's, and that's a good question. Uh, yes and no. I mean, there are certain people that certainly didn't want to be photographed. But I think people, you know, people want to tell their stories. They want to be recognized. And actually, one of the most successful exhibits I had was in Menlo Park. It was actually the last, well, it was the exhibit, um, the last exhibit I had before Foothill. And it was just on farm farmers and farm workers. And I I invited the farmers and farm workers to come. And um, this was like two disparate communities, you know, the, the, the wealthy people here in Menlo Park coming together with the farmers and farm workers. And the most satisfying aspect of it was how the farmers and farm workers felt seen and honored and were so glad to be recognized and, and just to have these communities uh, come together. I mean, that was just very, very satisfying. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, anecdote, Mark. I wish I could have been there and we should have some more, I would say. Maybe okay. we could have some farmers come. I think, it, well, we should, yeah. But I'll ask Javier to come. <laughs> um, Maria Tanaka, thanks for being here, Maria. And Krista, um, I would like to know whether the farm owner and health authorities in our state were informed about what happened with Ernestina. Uh, great question. It touched. Yeah, it touched I think they have actually outlawed that pesticide. But um, yeah, I mean, they're aware of it. It's not like a secret. It's 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 just. I don't know, what can I say? It's like, it's criminality, basically, that it wasn't outlawed years and years ago when people knew about it. Yeah, marginalization, ongoing. Yes. Um, thanks, uh, great question, excellent, excellent answer. Um, Kathy C asks, how did you meet the folks you interviewed? Great question. Oh, that is a good question. You know, there's not one way, but basically, I started off with immigrants that I knew, okay? And then I, when you, you, you meet somebody, you always ask for other people that they recommend. So one of the, the big breaks, I can start with like the, um, with the, the, our, our land, our food. Cause I mentioned that I always went to farmer's markets and there was one vendor, it was Coke Farms, um, C-O-K-E <laughs> farms. And I knew the people there. And I told them what I was wanted to do in the project. And I asked them if I could do some uh, photographs of farm workers. So uh, the owner of, of the business, she was just fantastic. She started introducing me to people. And, uh, and you know, the, I don't know how far I would have gotten without that first uh, introduction. And, um, uh, Teresa with a hand over her face, uh, you know, she, she was like the first one of the first people that I photographed. But um, then, you know, she she introduced me to other farmers and farm workers. And um, Javier, I became friends with Javier, who introduced me to, to people at uh, Alba Farms. And a lot, uh, not yeah, and, and they're, they're the organization that uh, was training farm workers to become farmers. So you know, one thing led to another, and also it was good that I had my first book because I could show them the quality of the work of the first book, you know. And then I had a friend who is uh, Muslim, and she introduced me to some Muslim organizations that are trying to promote the rights of Muslims and. You know, I had to meet with people and, you know, convince them that I'm a, a serious person trying to do serious work. And so 
And yeah, so it to... sounds like a lot you got, you know, some of the people you had photographed, you worked with organizations, you had personal contact, so you kind of relied on it's like, Yeah, I mean, like the, each person in in the in the book would have a different story about how I got to meet them. Yeah, yeah, great. And you it's a lot of work. You're a journalist. <laughs> um Let's see. So uh, Ellen Kim asked two, three questions, but I think we've answered your first two, Ellen. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. Um, what considerations did you consider in determining the composition of the photographs? So that's more of a technical question. Like, how oh, well, do you go about I, I, I'm, Well, um, you, I don't know if you noticed, I mean, they were environmental portraits. I really want, the environment's very important in telling the stories. So I always tried to put people in an environment that so the environment says a lot, you know, helps illustrate the story. It tells a person, you know, who they are, what they're doing, how they contribute. So, you know, frankly, you know, my favorite group of photos was in that first section being out in, you know, agricultural areas. It's a lot easier to take a really impactful picture in, uh, in a, on a farm where, where you have the environment than people who are doing high tech work just sitting at a computer, you know. So um, I, I always, you know, try to include a good part of the environment as much as I could. Yeah, well, you did a great job both in the lively environments and also ones that are more static. You really, your creativity really comes out. And uh, I think anyone who comes to see the exhibition and or looks at and buys the book is going to agree. And I'm I'm so looking forward to it. Um, uh, it, it, uh, someone, uh, Pramod, I'm, I, I hope that's your name. Um, look, it says, look, looks like a wonderful book. Unfortunately, we're living in a very polarized society and we seem to be in an echo chamber. How do we reach this other side with your ideas, with these ideas, um, that you're presenting? Well, that's an excellent, excellent question. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I so here's a little backstory. I didn't intend to do a book, okay? My publisher convinced me to do a book. What I really was hoping to do was just to have a lot of exhibits in as many public places as possible. You know, not necessarily museums, but really public venues, libraries, or where people would actually go and, and, and see these images and, and try and reach like a cross section of the population. And, and that's something I still hope to do. And um, so one of the things I've done is um, I've hired Amazon to help publicize the book because one of the things I, I really want to do is get this book into as many libraries as possible. And if I can get a rich benefactor, I'd like to send a book to every member of Congress. <laughs> there are any rich benefactors out there? <laughs> I had one more E in my last name. I would be it, but I do not have two E's. <laughs> but I'll stump for you. But it's it, you're right. We're in echo chambers, and it's very, very depressing. And um, you know, um, I mean, the immigration system's like totally broken from so many different aspects. But everyone agrees it's broken. But the and people have radically different solutions for it. So, you know. well, let's try to get this book in the hands of as many people that um, can support, you know, making change as possible. I think your images certainly do, you know, provide a human look, a really humanizing look into these people that are so much a part of this rhetoric that um, we need to, uh, well, I won't go there right now. Um, Simon Pennington asks, given the current political climate, kind of relating back to this, did you ever have to convince anyone to be photographed or did you not really go to that length? Did you really just want to- No, I, I never had to convince okay. anybody. It was either yes or no, you know, it's like, I never, um, yeah, I, I don't want to have anybody in the book who's, uh, ambiguous about it. It's sure. interesting. There was one doctor at Stanford and uh, I knew she was ambiguous and I asked her and I would have liked to have included her, but she said no. So mm -hmm. yeah, great. 
Great question, uh, Simon. Um, Isaac uh, would like to know once again what the name of the book is. Oh, it's Together We Rise, Immigrants in America. Thanks. But just email me and I'll keep you on a mail list when the book's out. For me. And Isaac, his email is in the chat, as is for everybody else as well. Sean is asking, what challenges do you face in portraying the depth of human rights issues through your photography? And how do you overcome those? What Much challenges do you face? Either emotionally, physically, like, great question. Yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I mean. I, I, I think the hardest challenges is for me have been the interviewing the asylum seekers or the women that have been so physically abused. It, you know, it, it, it's very, very painful. And it, it, it really raises a broader question in my mind. And it's, you know, where, where, where do you draw the line? Because there are so many women in, in, in the world. I mean, it's so common for this kind of physical abuse is violence mm -hmm. because you know my last book was on you know if you're talking a lot about violence against women and you know we're a country where we can't we can't accept every case you know even half the world would be coming here it's just so it's very it's it's very painful that and that was the most painful but it's also sad to hear the stories about uh, immigrant farm workers who can't go and visit their families. They're so mm -hmm. you know, desperate to see them, even when members of their families die. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and one thing I, I didn't do, and a, a lot of it was because of the pandemic, and uh, I didn't go down to the border to actually photograph recent immigrants. And, I feel kind of like I should have done that maybe. I still will. I don't know. Yeah, there's still time. Uh, this work is not done. Um, Marshall asks, was this project limited to California or did you travel outside? Great well, question, Marshall. Yeah, well, it's mostly limited to California. Um, you know, I was doing this pro bono. Nobody was paying me to do this. So I really had to limit wow. my uh, my expenses. I, I mean, I had plenty of expenses as it turns out anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly limited California, but I was up in Washington state and I photographed a farmer up there. And there was um, a couple of one or two people that flew in from other parts of the country that I photographed. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's mostly limited, but uh, I have current plans to go to Atlanta in February and photograph some American communities there and have an exhibit there, which goes back to the question about, um, you know, how to influence people. And, uh, it's going to be in one of those purple areas where the exhibit will be. So there's an important election coming up and mm -hmm. maybe this will help. Sway a few voters. I, I don't know. It's <laughs> thanks, Mark. Um, another question from Yasmin. How long uh, was it to make the book? How long did you work on on um, this project? Well, there have been so many major interruptions. Frankly, um, mm -hmm. believe it or not, I started in twenty eighteen, and then the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. and that take took. What I don't know is it about a year and a half, or or more that I didn't work. I I have a uh, immunocompromised daughter, and I had to be very very careful too. Mm -hmm. um, me back for her, but so, um, and then <laughs> if anybody wants to talk about raising making a book. I mean, that's a whole separate conversation. That'll be our next workshop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We still have five <laughs> questions. So I want to roll through these. Don't go there. <laughs> it took a long, long time to raise the money to make the book. I mean, there were, 
I mean, I don't want to go into it, but we, we probably wasted uh, another year and a half trying to get the money to raise the book. Raise mm, the money. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. So As there's a lot of, you oh, know, sorry. I say the the photography, the actual photography, if, if I just think about the times they actually photographed, uh, probably a couple of years. The rest of the time was in, you know, the pandemic and trying to raise money. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the design takes time and doing all the editing takes a lot of time. So you started in 2018 and it's coming out in 2024. So we yeah. can say yeah. six years. If not for the pandemic and uh, it would have been done a couple of years soon. Oh, say la vie. Mm -hmm. It's here now. We're so, I'm so happy I'm here with you. Well, unfortunately, uh, the topic's more relevant than ever. Isabella asks, how did you decide which stories within the community to focus on? Or did you did you just kind of go with the stories as they came with the people? Like No, I had to really, as I said, I had to really think about how to organize the book. Nice. So I, I I tried to, you know, it was a combination of how good the photo was and how good the interview was. Mm -hmm. And um but it, the basic theme is how people contribute and even if they're coming as asylum seekers how they really want to educate their children or the hopes and dreams they have for them um, christina um is asking another great question she wants to know if you had a list of questions for the interview yes i did interviews yes. yeah were they all the same for each one or did you kind of go with yeah, the i kind of modified it but you know you have a list of questions and then you uh, sort of go where the interview takes you, you know. Um, and and um, so I, it's just a basic list of questions. And then I, just, I try to be a good listener and try and follow up on some things that people say. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I basically recorded all the interviews and I had them transcribed, mm -hmm. edited from the transcription. And I, I did have the opportunity to be with Mark when he was photographing and uh, up in Washington and oh, yeah, that's right. help help hold the let the remote light and mm -hmm. and and just his calm and his presence made I think made people made the people there feel safe and and really let them show their their soul as the in in their in their space and in their work, which was just a gift, Mark. I really appreciated that opportunity to watch you at work. That was great. I love photos, you. Same photos in the book. <laughs> um, Yasmin also asked, how did it make you feel? How do you feel? How did you feel when you were talking to people? What kind of feelings came up for you? Um, that's a great question. It depends who I was talking to, you know. Um, it was, you know, a mixture of feelings, you know. It's like... Mm -hmm. Like I, I, if I had a good interview, I say, "Wow, this is so great! This is so important!" I just mm -hmm. really very excited to really share it, and um, and and then you know, especially if you learn something new, you really really want to share it. It's very exciting to share. Like I didn't really know about the pesticides. Yeah, you know, probably a lot of people don't know about that, and. Um, you know, I didn't know a lot of things that like farm workers have to go through. And, uh, you know, the fact that they pay their taxes and have no benefits and then there's no visas for them. I mean, it's really crazy. You know, I think during the pandemic, we saw how unbelievably we were dependent on what we call essential workers. But a lot of those workers are undocumented and they, mm -hmm. and they have no rights. Mm-hmm. So multiple feelings, multiple different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we're at one o'clock, so we should maybe do you have I a think we're, yeah, I think that's I think we're good. So if anybody wants to talk about them, you know, producing a book, I'd be glad to talk about that some other time. Yeah, let's have a work, let's create a workshop. I think that would be something that our entire community would really uh, get a lot out of, including me, maybe mm -hmm. Ardeen, 
maybe Kate, but she's already doing the book classes mm -hmm. like crazy, you know, um, but I, I'm, I've been asked about that for a lot of people. So um, yeah, I'll be quiet now. Kate, <laughs> thank you so much for bringing Mark to us. Um, and I'll, I'll say thank you right now and mute my mic. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your work. We're really looking forward to sh continuing to share the work through the Krauss Center for Innovation Exhibition. If you'd like to be on the mailing list for the reception that Mark will, will have for Mark later this quarter, please, my email is in the chat. And thank you, our Dean Ron Herman, for all the support of our programs. And I uh, hope you all have a wonderful day. And mm -hmm. sign up for photo classes. We're here. Email us and we'll we'll tell you more. Thank you. Thank you. Edu slash photo.